Avelina Meke Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Aloha Sustainability in Hawaii and Peace in our Pacific. We're looking at the UN Sustainable Development Goals Movement and Moana Nui Akea, and today we're looking at UN SDG's Guide for Good Acts for Local Authority and Shab Anad Sifol providing a path for the Pacific Islands to impact the UN 2030 Agenda. Thank you, Lance, for joining us so much today. Thank you for having me, Josh. I'm happy to be here. Today, what we're going to look at, which is so exciting, is we're beginning a new show called Aloha Sustainability in Hawaii. And what better guest could we have than a person with experience around the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but also seeing their importance, not just in our islands, but in the international arena and around even the nation. Lance, could you tell us a bit about why the Sustainable Development Goals are so important. Absolutely. Um, the SDGs, the United Nations SDGs, are an incredible set of priorities that the entire uh, uh, collection of UN member countries have agreed to support and advance. That in and of itself is quite astounding to have so many different member nations commit to a number of discrete goals to advance sustainability uh, across a shared set of priorities for the globe. What's really important about the SDGs is they codify a set of measurable uh, aspirational goals that will help us um, really make movement no matter where you are nationally. So um, very developed countries like the United States, many European nations have different types of targets than those that are struggling with earlier stages of development um, and perhaps less economic resource. What's really phenomenal about these goals though is that they've been designed to be implemented at a very localized level. So the predecessor for the sustainable development goals uh, were the series of goals uh, captured within the Millennium Development Challenge or the Millennium Development Goals. Those were much um, larger, things like, you know, uh, reducing poverty, reducing infant mortality, again, very important goals, but um, they were largely addressed at the nation state level. So we're talking federal bureaucracies, ministerial bureau bureaucracies, and very few frontline stakeholders who were facing these uh, sustainability challenges had an opportunity or a hand in addressing them. And what's really exciting about the SDGs and what's called Agenda 2030 um, which is the goal of really making significant progress on all of these goals by 2030, um, is that they are explicitly designed to involve and engage local stakeholders. So everyday people have an opportunity to contribute to these SDGs. And in fact, there's an explicit mandate that I'll talk about later as they relate to the CFAL Global Network and many of the other uh, UN agencies that are actively promoting local stakeholder involvement. Um, so an example of this is you know, clean water, uh, very important SDG. All of us want clean water, all of us need clean water. What it means to address clean water priorities in one country can be very different than another, but everyone can have a hand in addressing water quality, reporting issues in water quality, um, helping to you know, clean uh, waterways from you know, extant pollution, obvious instances of pollution, but then it obviously also extends to more sophisticated interventions, some of those in the private sector, some of those um, in the governmental sector, but everyone has a role to play. And I think that's the really exciting thing about these SDGs is they're easy to understand, they're easy to relate to, they resonate with everyone because they are you know, plainly important climate action, equality, gender equality, uh, reduced inequalities, poverty. Um, these are things that people can understand immediately. And then they, of course, are also broken down into much more discrete targets that people can rally around and um, put, you know, their own resources towards addressing and solving. One of the, you know, big water quality issues here in Hawaii, as you know, Josh, is the Red Hill contamination. This is a major uh, series of underwater, underground, excuse me, um, uh, uh, containers or um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, reservoirs of fuel 
that um, have been leaking into our underground aquifer. And so it was really largely a local uh, response. Regular people, particularly those who are directly affected by this contamination that led to a major change in policy um, by the military and really led to some major um, changes in the way that we address uh, contaminants in water quality. So that's a really localized example here in Hawaii of how we are taking action on something like clean water and ensuring that uh, we advance those priorities in, in local stakeholder concerns. Lance, that was actually perfect because I remember when we were creating the SDGs and the advocacy from 2012 at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit, and then from 2013 to 2015, that governments coming together, the civil society coming together, the major groups, and agreeing on these 17 global goals. And then the 169 targets as well, as well as the indicators. And I'll never forget President Obama at the time. He said, we don't have to go across a border. We can just go across a bridge, saying that what really that you were sharing with us that was so insightful is the Millennium Development Goals are sort of more top down. It was sort of, this is what you developing countries need. And what the two things they said with the Sustainable Development Goals, with the 2030 agenda was, everyone everywhere on earth has an opportunity to organize and be part of this movement and as you said it's common it's even a common new language you can almost talk about these goals among cultures with the boxes and with the different logos to then describe and everyone knows oh yes we have the exact same and you're really good example of sdg number six on clean water and sanitation talking about what has been happening in hawaii shows that it might be different in each place but everyone has that right to clean, healthy water, and that we have to then be able to take actions at our home to then make sure that we're also in line with the global agenda that all of the governments, as you said, agreed. Every government agreed in September of 2015. I remember the Pope being there as well, yep. saying that this is a new way forward for the world, but we're all speaking the same language and we know what we're talking about. It's not a different track for some people, in the Pacific and a different track for the Arctic. We have one planet and we have one island Earth. And together, these 17 goals provide the steps of how we can all participate and be part of this process to preserve and protect our planet, but make sure also that all people are respected on Earth as well. And as you described it, looking at discrimination, looking at clean water, looking at renewable energy, at ending poverty and zero hunger, all of these are connected and not to see them in silos, which I think is also fresh as we get into Shamana later. We're getting different levels of academia, different departments to all say together we have an insight to these challenges and we can be a solution at the university and an engine for real positive equality and more importantly, as you were getting into equity. So these SDGs are amazing new step forward. You, this is not your first experience with sustainable development goals. Maybe you can share in some place where you have been involved and how you've seen them have a promising practice and what that then can bring to Hawaii as we're looking at how to actualize the global 17 global goals in the 2030 agenda at home in Hawaii. Well said, Josh. Um, I, I want to respond to your question, but you've inspired me a little bit talking about kind of the equity of the SDGs. Um, that's a really important point. And the fact that everyone is being held to the same macro uh, goals, even though some of the, the, the targets might be a little bit different or interpreted differently at the, net, at the nation state level, I think it really does show that we are all in this together. And it's an integration that we really ne have never had um, on issues of sustainability, cross-border, um, and obviously on a, on a global stage. The other issue, though, is um, these are very empowering. And I say that on a, on a micro level. So I, I'm a linguist, but I teach a class called Communicating Sustainability to students here at Chaminade University. And you, you would perhaps believe, but maybe be surprised at the degree to which students find it relieving to be able to articulate not only goals that we have locally that they can you know address in small ways in their daily lives or in you know their larger peer groups but that they connect and articulate to these big global challenges that seem so overwhelming 
And, you know, our young people today in particular are facing this sort of existential dread of a changing climate and an unsustainable future. And I think what the SDGs provide in many respects are tangible opportunities for uh, people of all backgrounds to say, look, we can make small progress on these enormous, overwhelming global challenges. And it, it makes them feel better about you know, some of the, the very difficult issues that we all share and that we all face. So I think that's just a very important point I should have mentioned earlier. Thank you for inspiring me to, to share it. This has not been um, a, a new phenomenon for me in terms of working with the SDGs. I, I've been fortunate enough to serve as a United Nations Fellow uh, for about a decade through the UN Institute for Training and Research. So this is uh, one of the larger UN entities. It has a number of smaller uh, units underneath that umbrella, but UNITAR, as it's known, um, is a very important um, uh, vehicle for implementing the SDGs. In fact, it is the only United Nations agency whose sole purpose it is to educate and help implement the SDGs specifically. All of the UN agencies have a role in operationalizing the SDGs in one form or another. But what's interesting about UNITAR, because of its, you know, its training and research mission, it really has been transformed is into the primary educational vehicle for the SDGs. And part of that um, mandate involves something called the CFAL Global Network. CFAL is a French acronym, and it really translates as um, International Centers for Training Local Experts. And what that means in, in practicality is these CFAL centers, there are now 24 of them around the world. Um, and these CFAL centers are responsible for providing education, training, and research insights to help local people, experts, and they may be trained experts or, or they may be novice experts that are developing expertise, train them to address the SDGs in their own communities. So again, it's about taking those global priorities that were so important to the Millennium Development Goals and giving local people on the front lines who are often facing the brunt of these sustainability challenges, giving them the tools, the knowledge, the empowerment to solve some of these challenges themselves. Now, my experience with the CFAL Global Network, um, again, goes back about eight, nine years, and it started with um, a, a previous iteration of the leadership of UNITAR. So the, the previous uh, Assistant Secretary General and Executive Director of, of UNITAR was Sally Fagan Wiles. And um, Sally has done some amazing work in really promoting the CFAL Global Network, expanding its size. And that work has continued under the current Assistant Secretary General, Nikhil Seth. What's important about that leadership is that these are people who have been involved in sustainability within the United Nations for 30 plus years. Uh, Nikhil himself you know, was um, one of many important architects for Agenda 2030. He wrote some of the initial outlines and draft white papers that led to the current iterations of the SDGs and Agenda 2030. And so the opportunity to work with some of these you know, global luminaries is really, really important um, for uh, our constituency, the people of Hawaii, the people of the Pacific, peoples of the Pacific, and giving them the opportunity to draw on incredible expertise that, again, goes back long before sustainability was so sexy, was so you know, top of mind for much of the rest of the world. And um, it's, it's important that we draw lessons from many of our peer seafall centers around the world. So again, there are 24 of them, they all have slightly different areas to focus. Our center here in the Pacific is obviously foc focused on um, island communities and some of the unique challenges that we face in island communities. Also, many communities that deal with multicultural and, and particularly indigenous communities that have been Excellent. marginalized and disenfranchised. And so we have, of course, a different set of priorities for education, training, empowerment through research innovation than, for example, a center in Belgium uh, or a center in Malaga, Spain, uh, both of which do excellent work, but very different types of work. Um, my own experience with CFAL actually precedes the establishment of our center here in, in Honolulu. 
Um, I actually had the opportunity to serve on the board and then later chair Seafall Atlanta, which was the very first North American uh, Seafall Center. Uh, it was the first uh, American-based Seafall Center. And it was a, a wonderful example of uh, a Seafall Center focused on civil and human rights. So Atlanta, of course, is an important uh, location with, with some very significant history related to the American Civil Rights Movement. And it's now you know, home to so many major institutions focused on the American Civil Rights Movement, which continues in terms of its priorities and struggles for equality and uh, reconciliation. And so uh, entities like Seafall Atlanta um, can teach us a lot about um, techniques and strategies at the local level for engendering support for priorities like civil and human rights. And we can expand those to some of the, the bigger priorities here in Hawaii uh, around you know, environmental justice, around ecological restoration. There was a wonderful discussion recently highlighted in the paper this morning about this new green fee for Hawaii, which would be the first you know, example of you know, a financial investment in Hawaii's ecological future. Those are, you know, th there are many examples around the world and even some uh, around the country of innovative approaches to policy solutions and just kind of grassroots support for resolving some of these common challenges that we face. And so I think what's really valuable as we've moved forward is we've been able to rally a lot of these other experts that have a lot more experience um, in this space than we do here at CIFO Honolulu. We're, we're new to this uh, engagement. We've got a lot of partners locally, but what's really important is that we can draw upon that legacy and that history of efficacy across so many domains of sustainability. And we're hoping to really tap into that over the next decade here. It's, it's actually perfect and I, it's tempting and I, I just wanna be in the class. So it's great to see that not only acting as provost, but also public policy making on a global scale, but then just the classroom. It would be so exciting to talk about communication and sustainability. And as you said, now students can see the 17 goals. If they wanna look at other countries, it's not trying to find something somewhere. Every country is all in agreement of looking at these goals. And then as you described it, the different aspects um, here in Geneva now, right across from the UNITAR, and there's so many acronyms, right? And in America, people only maybe know UNICEF because of trick or treat and Halloween. But as you were talking about, there's so many UN agencies, UNESCO, UN women that are really so valuable to life and death for people all around the planet. And UNITAR is just one of those UN specialized agencies, programs, and funds. But you went into such depth to describe its significance for society to see how it can serve. And then I really like the point that you were bringing up at the end of really decarbonizing, but also decolonizing. Yeah. And that in a way, Sifo Hawaii is new, but has a lifetime of memory. In fact, indigenous peoples had most of this knowledge and it's relearning. And it's what you were sharing that I think you know also from your experience in linguists, it's, it's respecting the indigenous host culture that has the insights in a way, maybe the keys to the future that's one of more balance that has been trying to share that but hasn't been listening the world hasn't but un sustainable development goals the 2030 agenda is one avenue that we can all pursue together and as you were talking about the students it also plugs them into the global process it's not oh what work can i do or what can i be if they're purposeful if they have a life of meaning and they want to be part of this global movement they can do actions daily in the class, on campus, in the community, at the Hawaii State Capitol, as you're sharing the new aspects what Governor Green is proposing, and then make a difference in Hawaii, but then compare that and be able to learn, as you're saying, many other countries, what we're facing in Hawaii isn't only happening to Hawaii. So these CEPL network allows all of us to sort of have people who are our peers around the planet saying, hey, we're looking at this, what do you think? And what have you done? And then, as you said, Malaga might be doing something amazing and the Netherlands might be doing something well, but we in Hawaii might also have a story to share. And the best part is Hawaii is now part of a piece of that global puzzle 
thanks to the work of bringing Seafold to Honolulu. Also, as you pointed out, Atlanta, that was a huge step too. And I just was meeting with the new US ambassador and she had a huge role in Atlanta before. And she's gonna come to a Human Rights Cities Leadership Conference in May. And she said she's hosting people from the museum right now here in Geneva. So it's that whole aspect of everyone everywhere has a part of the story can now speak the same language. And that puts us to where we're at today, where you've already done an amazing job of bringing a UN Undersecretary General, who, as you said, is really an architect, has his heart in this game. And I was so inspired by his speech at the launch that you did at the end of November and early December. He had a couple of keynotes, but I also remember meeting him last year. And he was saying, this is, I think I remember, we need a blowtorch. And we've got to take action now. And to hear UN Undersecretary General have that perspective, I think is refreshing as well for people indigenous, as you were saying, but also people of the Pacific who know that climate is an existential threat, who don't want to have more talk, as he said, but actually taking tasks and doing action. And so that puts us where we are now, that we have a new Sifal Shamana, as you described, our work is to do education and training and being a unit for unity and in part of a, the real, the larger ohana of Moana Nui Akea. And maybe you can share with us a bit about what's been going on. I, I thought that was one panel, getting back to your teaching, where you had people who were graduates, students who are graduates who are now working in all, all these SDGs. And we can maybe share how the students can be part of that, but also the faculty. And then together, Tifal Shamna can bring together even the capital, as you brought in Josh Green when he was Lieutenant Governor, now Governor, to really make sure that we're all partners for the global goals, which is Global Goal 17. Well, thank you, Josh. Um, yes, we are incredibly humbled and very enthusiastic about this new United Nations Center, Seafall Honolulu, and hosted on our campus here at Chaminade. And I guess what really um, made sense to us about the proposal to establish this center, we were approached by UNITAR, by the United Nations, and really invited to propose a center and, and host the center here at Chaminade. And we went through a, a lot of discernment to make sure that that was the right decision. We wanted to make sure that if we were going to in, in, um, initiate something like this, that we could do it with integrity and we could do it from a place of partnership um, to be clear, we don't see ourselves as, you know, the leaders or the example uh, for sustainability in Hawaii. We see ourselves as a vehicle and a facilitator for other people. We want to empower other people. And that was really what led us to establish Seafall Honolulu. We, we saw the Seafall Endeavor as an opportunity to continue what we have been doing our entire history as an institution of higher education. And that is to empower people through education, to empower the people of Hawaii through education, and more specifically, to empower those who are oftentimes marginalized and not given opportunity uh, at decision-making tables to have the knowledge and the, the preparation and the formation to be effective in those, in those spaces. And so um, what's really compelling about the Seafall Honolulu Endeavor is that you know, we have said from the outset that we are looking to partner with other organizations here in Hawaii and across the Pacific that have been doing incredible work much longer than we have. And we are you know, committed to sustainability, but we're really looking to uh, find synergies with both private sector nonprofit, private sector for-profit business, as well as the governmental sector to see if we can amplify or otherwise expand the impact that they're having. And so we want to be a multiplier, um, not a, you know, another duplication of what people might already be doing. And most importantly, we want to learn from our host culture and, and the very beautiful multicultural fabric of Hawaii and the Pacific. We have so many peoples here, so many cultural perspectives, so many languages I always like to appreciate as a linguist. And there's so much to be discovered still in terms of best practices for ecological stewardship, for sustainability in general. I think part of our mission and mandate is to really listen carefully and ensure that we are identifying 
um, alternative approaches that are uh, either better or just alternative ways of accomplishing the same goals that resonate with peoples of, of the Pacific communities. And one of the, you know, one of the excellent examples of this, you mentioned the student panel. So we had a, a major um, inauguration for our center, which also served as a um, annual meeting for all of the Seafall centers around the world. So we hosted really about 35 diplomats from around the world, um, several of them from Geneva, from the UN headquarters in Geneva. And that included Nikhil Seth, our Assistant Secretary General. And the idea was um, to talk about our shared priorities, but also we were allowed to showcase some of what we were prioritizing here in Hawaii. And what was really striking, before I talk to you about the student panel, what was really striking in hearing from Nikhil, the Assistant Secretary General, but also all of the other Seafall leaders, was how much they were impressed with Hawaii's approach to managing these problems. And so we had a number of our partners from the East West Center, University of Hawaii, um, Pacific Asian Affairs Council, which works with high school students, and so many others. We had them come and talk about their approaches and our shared approaches to solving problems here in Hawaii. And I think it really left a tremendous impression on our global partners through the CFO Global Network that there are, are different ways to bring people together and to solve differences and disagreements in ways that you know, are very inclusive, that um, give opportunities for all voices to be heard in ways that they might not otherwise um, be familiar with. I heard a lot from my colleagues about the, the heart, the authenticity of the approaches that we used. Um, we had a beautiful um, welcome ceremony from um, some of our uh, uh, senior cultural practitioners here in Hawaii that really grounded our meeting and our discussion in an understanding of our place within the Aina, within the environment, within the earth. And I think that really set the tone for the rest of our meeting and our showcase. But back to our students. Um, now, these are our students, but our endeavors are not limited to Chaminade students. We just wanted to showcase the legacy that we have. So we have thousands of Chaminade alumni across the Pacific Islands. And we had a panel, a virtual panel, that showcased many of those alumni who are working back in their home communities of American Samoa um, and Yap and um, uh, Guam and talking about the work that they're doing on a local level and how um, their training and formation at Chaminade and you know, the unique ethos that we engender here of kind of a holistic values-based educational approach is informing that work and how they're partnering with Seafall Honolulu to again, expand the impact. So the goal that we have here is to partner with local stakeholders, whether they're experts at the, at the beginning or they want to become experts and really help them tool up so that they can have more impact in, in ways that are important to them. I think what's really um, maybe innovative about, about some of our work right now is we're looking to see how we can um, adapt some of the SDGs in ways that make more sense to local communities. And by that, I mean, when you're talking about climate action with you know, some of our partners in the Marshall Islands. We're gonna be meeting with um, some leaders from the College of the Marshall Islands later this week. And when we talk to them about some of the partnerships, they're, they're really concerned about existential you know, challenges. They can't talk about the other SDGs without talking about mitigating rising seas and the climate action priorities that they have. And so it really contextualizes the broader fabric of the 17 SDGs when you're working with communities that are facing you know, existential ends as a result of one or two of these sustainability challenges. The other really important and I think hallmark approach that we'll be taking with Seafall Honolulu relates to data. Um, so we have uh, the state's first undergraduate uh, data science, analytics and visualization program. Now there are additional programs that have grown since, but we have continued to invest not just in data science generally, but in data science that is specifically useful to local communities. And so our data science program has a number of outreach initiatives that are focused on indigenous communities, on other marginalized communities, and helping them get control of their data for their communities so that they can make 
compelling arguments for policy change to governmental stakeholders like Governor Green, who's been a, an enormous supporter of our Seafall Honolulu Center, and who has championed better data-driven data decision-making uh, across government, but also across the private sector. And so one of our priorities through a new uh, National Science Foundation grant is going to be uh, empowering Pacific communities through a, a number of data science initiatives, both credentialed and um, kind of community driven, giving them the technological tools to, to kind of collate masses amounts of data. So health records, environmental degradation, you know, sea level rise in ways that um, measure uh, erosion and other types of local impacts on their island communities. And so they've got a lot of data, they just can't make sense of it because they don't have the tools to really analyze and synthesize it into useful information. And so that's gonna be a major initiative as we move forward. And it's funded through a number of uh, concomitant grants that will help us have more impact. We've actually partnered with all of the uh, local colleges, many of them two year colleges across the Pacific Island region to make sure that we have local partners who, who can implement a lot of this on the ground and uh, then feedback information to us about what needs to be adapted or changed to, to improve impact. So much to share there, and it's so exciting. I'm so glad this new series of Aloha, Sustainability in Hawaii and Peace in our Pacific will cover all the global goals, all 17, and you really are sharing the UN Sustainable Development Goals Movement and Moana Nui Kea. And we can think of CIFO as really Kalo that we're now planting that will have many offshoots that then will be able to be nourishing all of the people of Hawaii, but around Oceania. And we see this as a great beginning. And thank you so much, Lance, for taking time to share with us today, really what's going on and to see how Seafal Shamana is providing a path for Pacific Islands to impact the UN 2030 agenda. Mahalo. Mahalo, thank you, Josh. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.